Hassan Reddick's holdout continues. The NHL's newest club is off to a red-hot start, and Jerry West becomes the first three-time Basketball Hall of Fame inductee. It's Tuesday, October 15th. I'm your host for today, David Rumsey, filling in for Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're sitting down with ESPN's Emily Kaplan to discuss the NHL's return to the ice, as well as Utah's red-hot start. We also hear from Houston Texans defensive end Will Anderson on his young NFL career and what it's like playing under head coach D'Amico Ryans. Plus, Alex Schiffer joins the show to break down Hassan Reddick's ongoing holdout with the Jets. First, let's hit today's headlines. The Lightning returned to Tampa Bay Tuesday night after their home opener against the Hurricanes Saturday night was delayed following Hurricane Milton hitting the region last week. The team has donated hundreds of tickets to first responders and other recovery workers, as well as discounting tickets to the first three home games of the season as part of the Tampa Bay Strong Initiative. Previously, team owner Jeff Vinnick pledged $2 million in relief efforts following Hurricane Helene roughly two weeks ago. On to the NBA, Jerry West has made history as the first person to be inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame three different times. West, largely known as the inspiration behind the NBA's signature logo, was first enshrined in the Hall of Fame for his time on the Lakers in 1979. He was inducted a second time in 2010 as a member of the 1960 Olympic men's basketball team. Now, after his passing in June, West is getting the NBA's ultimate recognition once again for his contributions as a Lakers executive. The Lakers won eight championships under West guidance. In the world of football, College Game Day is headed to Austin ahead of number one Texas's matchup with the number five ranked Georgia Bulldogs on Saturday. It's a marquee matchup for college football and could be a preview of the SEC championship game, or maybe even a matchup within the college football playoffs. The college game day won't be alone in Austin this weekend as Formula One is returning to the city for the United States Grand Prix. Attendance for that event hit over 400,000 people last year. So between the race and college game day, good luck to anyone looking for a hotel in Austin this weekend. On to the NFL. Eagles fans were calling for Nick Sirianni's job after a close call with the now 1-5 Cleveland Browns on Sunday. Lincoln Financial Field broke out in boos and chants of fire Nick during the game. The Eagles managed to hold on to a lead winning 2016, and Nick Sirianni had some words for the fans after the game. After the game was over, Sirianni was seen chirping with fans on the sideline. When asked what was said during the sideline exchange, Sirianni said, just excited, just excited to win. Hassan Reddick is continuing his holdout against the New York Jets with NFL agent Drew Rosenhaus after CAA Sports parted ways with the linebacker over the weekend. We'll have more on why CAA Sports let go of Reddick and what to expect from his continued holdout up next with reporter Alex Schiff. All right, we are pleased to be joined by front office sports reporter Alex Schiffer. Alex, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you, David. How you doing? Doing great. Uh, having fun filling in for uh, Owen today, the show's normal host. But um, yeah, let's take a look at uh, ongoing situation in the NFL. We still have one marquee holdout in Hassan Reddick uh, with the Jets. Can you bring us up to speed? What's going on with him right now? Yeah, you know, to, to recap, the Jets traded for Hassan Reddick in March, late March. His press conference was April 1st. He was going into the final year of his deal, which pays about $14 million. Had his press conference, didn't sound like a guy that was about to uh, go through one of the weirder holdouts in recent NFL memory. Uh, was excited to be there. You know, big-time pass rusher out of Temple. I think he's got around 59 career NFL sacks, and 27 of those have been in the last two years with the Eagles. And he showed up to the Jets on April 1st for his physical and press conference, and they haven't seen him since as he – this is now, I guess, where we go into the game of uh, he said, he said. Um, the Jets traded for Hassan Reddick knowing his contract status and seemed to be open to a long-term deal after the season. They uh, they offered him a short-term deal when they traded for him, which he declined. And in August, Hassan Reddick requested a trade from the Jets. You know, I think the Jets only paid like a conditional sixth-round pick for him, so it's not like this was a huge bounty or a huge market. And Joe Douglas said, we're not doing that. We expect him here. He has since accrued about $9 million in fines between his missed game checks and not showing up. And on Friday, I reported that um, CAA, his primary representation through all this, has dropped him as a client. 
And now today, Drew Rosenhaus, who was like the Scott Borez of the NFL, just a total super agent. Um, he's been in the news, also represents Tyree Kill of the Dolphins. He's been very involved with him with everything that happened with him and the cops down there in Miami. And that is his new client. So maybe a resolution is in sight uh, after, what's this now? So April 1st, we're going on over six months of this. Yeah, that's uh, that's a lot. Thanks for the uh, quick recap there. And yeah, I think I just looked it up. It was a conditional third there. So a little bit more than a sixth, but still, obviously, it's not like giving up two firsts for a QB or something like a, the Deshaun Watson trade. That's but yeah, a, a reference. A, a, as we're recording this um, uh, hours before Monday night football kicks off, um, there's also reports that Rosenhaus is supposed to meet with uh, Jet, the Jets uh, front office brass to try to figure this one out. Um, I mean, how, how big a deal is this and how unprecedented is this for a contract dispute to be so high profile and an agency to seemingly drop a player like this who has some really good stats and then force them to go get the big guns, so to say, in Drew Rosenhaus? Yeah, this is definitely unconventional. I mean, I think training camp is traditionally holdout season. You saw C.D. Lamb hold out this year. You saw some 49ers guys like Brandon Ayuk hold out. The 49ers seem to have a holdout every single year. Um and usually that gets resolved before the season starts. To me, this one's weird in a few different senses in that, you know, you can kind of point to guys like C.D. Lamb and, and Brandon Ayuk with the way the wide receiver market has been the past few years as guys that might go down that road and the way they were talking beforehand. Um, like I said earlier, Hassan Reddick's comments, if you go back to his press conference, he did not sound like a guy who was about to put the Jets through all this. So that's been weird. I think C.A. dropping him is weird in the sense that – uh you know, again, normally you don't really see holdouts result in agent changes. And I think this is one of those rare cases. And I, I missed this in my recap earlier, but, uh, you know, also Woody Johnson making a direct plea to Hassan Reddick in his press conference, firing the follow the fo- blah, blah, blah. following the firing, try saying that five times fast, following the firing of Robert Sala, essentially made a direct plea to, um, to Hassan Reddick to drive up by 95. He's from South Jersey, Camden area and, and rejoin the team. So I think that, you know, this has been a multifaceted when you think about the agent change, the the lack of warning signs, and also just ownership directly pleading with a player, which you don't really see a lot. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the Woody Johnson bit, because when you have a player of his caliber, a pass rusher, an important position like that, especially for a team trying to get back on track after firing a coach, everybody from fans on up to the owner wants that player back in. We want to figure out a contract, what even if it's halfway through the season, Alex, you're in New York. You're going into the FOS office in New York mo- most days. But um, around town, what are you hearing if you're talking to Jets Jets fans? Or what, what are they saying about Hassan Reddick? Yeah, I, I would actually say full disclaimer, I am a Jets fan. Um, it hasn't been a huge conversation piece, at least with the people I've talked to. And maybe it's just because Aaron Rodgers kind of dominates the talk of the team right now. But like I, I would say, you know, to your point, this is a team that hasn't made the playoffs since I was in high school in 2010. Um, they have the longest postseason drought in the NFL, one of the longest in North American sports. You know, they can certainly use him. And there are some interesting implications in that if I, th- I think it's week 10, if he is not reported that the Jets retain his rights for the next season and his whole free agency thing goes uh, down the drain. So I-, I think they can certainly use him. I don't think he is a immediate fix it if he plays tonight to the Jets and their problems. I think that it goes beyond him, but the defense has been a little underwhelming. But I think that, you know, Hassan Reddick is kind of riding the waves of the Mets, Yankees, hockey season starting. You know, I think that he'd be all over the New York radio waves if there weren't so many other good things going on around him. So I uh, I definitely think it's a conversation piece, but I just think there's so much else going on right now that he's being able to fly under the radar. Um, if this is still a thing in a week or two when the Mets and or Yankees are knocked out, and uh, all of a sudden, it's just the Jets and hockey and, and basketball starting up. The Carl Towns trade is another thing that's obviously probably saved him from some headlines. Um, maybe we're having a different conversation. But I think that he's kind of benefited from the rest of the, uh, the news stream going on in the city. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, he probably owes a thank you to for less publicity. And um, again, just, uh, just the weirdness of it all, you know, I think has kind of made people maybe just a little like, you know, that's just a, you know, no one seems to really know the true pulse on the whole thing. And I think that's maybe a reason why as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a fascinating, bizarre uh, scenario. We'll see if it gets worked out but to, before that uh, crucial week 10 deadline. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, David.
A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. Oregon's 32-31 win over Ohio State drew the largest primetime audience for a regular season Big Ten Conference game since 2008, averaging 10.2 million viewers Saturday night across NBC, Peacock, and digital platforms. The matchup peaked at 13.4 million viewers towards the final minutes of the game. This comes just two weeks after Alabama's matchup with Georgia averaged nearly 12 million viewers over the course of the game. Keep in mind, last year's World Series averaged 9.1 million viewers, and the Stanley Cup final between the Oilers and Panthers averaged 8.8 million viewers. Two regular season college football games outdrew the finals for two of America's biggest sports leagues. Numbers like these illustrate why media rights with conferences like the Big Ten or SEC bring in so much money. Plus, conference realignment is making these big-time matchups start to feel like a regular weekly occurrence. Don't expect these eye-popping viewership numbers to stop coming in anytime soon. In sharp contrast to college football, NHL's opening night kicked off with a cold start. The season debut last week, featuring a triple header on ESPN, averaged just 559,000 viewers. That's down 39% from last year's season opener. To be fair to the league, last year's opening night featured the highly touted debut of Chicago Blackhawks phenom Connor Bedard. This year's season debut also had to battle with MLB and WNBA postseason games on at the same time. And if you compare it to 2022's opening night, one not featuring the debut of mega prospect Bedard, the NHL actually saw 3% higher viewership numbers this year than in 2022. With that all being said, it's obviously not an ideal start for the league, but with the whole season to go and a brand new team that's off to a red hot start in Utah, there's still plenty of time for the NHL to rebound later this season. We'll have more on the Utah Hockey Club and the outlook for the rest of the NHL with ESPN hockey reporter Emily Kaplan after this. Joined now by ESPN reporter Emily Kaplan. Welcome, Emily. Great to have you back on. Thank you, Owen. I love this semi-regular thing we got going. It's always good to check <laughs> yeah. in with you and chat about hockey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's start with the shiny object. Uh, hockey is in Utah now. And this already, I mean, it's technically not a new franchise, but this, it, to me, it has like a Seattle or Vegas vibe where it's a fresh start in a newly energized market. Exactly. It's a brand new market for the NHL, and that's what they're most excited about. It's also a brand new owner in Ryan Smith, who Gary Bettman clearly has taken a liking to, and to the point of like spending the entire day of opening night with him, sitting with him on the glass. Um, this is a young billionaire who's self-made in the tech space, and the NHL is just super enthusiastic about some of the ideas that he could bring to the league. Um, but as it pertains to his team, like everything I've heard from the players and just some of the mistreatment or just neglect that they were getting in Arizona over their last several ownership, all of that has been rectified. And they got to Utah, and they're like, look how much money they're spending on us. Like, look how much money they put into this temporary practice facility. And then they're going to spend millions of more on our new practice facility. Um, it's been very family oriented. The guys from the ones that I've talked to, mostly veteran players have enjoyed living down there, interacting with the fans in the market who are pretty enthusiastic about the team. So one for one success, their home opener, I think was, you know, a great success of a celebration of the thirst for hockey there, but we'll see how it shapes up throughout the season. Yeah, and Ryan Smith also feels like a new kind of owner for the NHL. I, I I'm realizing I can't name all the owners or anything, but uh, but I think you know it's usually a, an older set and you know a group that's done things a certain way for a long time. Whereas the NBA has a few of these young billionaires, including Ryan Smith, uh, that bring a fresh energy to the league. 
Completely. Um, I would say one thing that is specific about Ryan Smith, and I want to include his wife, Ashley Smith, who's also very involved. Um, I mentioned family oriented. They're super hands on, like they're conversing with the players, getting temperature of their needs. You know, what was not addressed in Arizona? What do you guys need to be a successful franchise? Um, That is something that I do find it's actually quite common across the NHL. Before you and I got on, I was telling you I was at the ring ceremony for the Florida Panthers on Monday, and their owner, Vinny Viola, individually handed the ring to each player and had a personalized anecdotal speech for each guy of why that guy was important to the ownership. Like, I don't know if you always see that across all of sports. So the one thing that Ryan Ashley Smith have is that personal touch, which I know is really important to Gary Bettman, you know, this league, even though it wants to be bigger and wants to grow revenue. Um, it really is a small community. Um, if you look at the NHL as a whole, at the same time, you're right. Like just his background in the tech space, just because, uh, you know, he didn't inherit the money. He got it himself. Um, all of that is new blood for the NHL. And I really do feel like they're going to tap into him being like, okay, you know, we've always done things a certain way. And sometimes we know we can be a bit archaic. We, we know we can speed up a bit here. Um, what are you seeing in other business spaces and how can we apply that to the NHL? Yeah, and actually just to linger on this a moment longer here, I'm wondering sort of like specifically where you're seeing that with Ryan Smith. I mean, I know he's got the like the $3 nachos, which is just an exciting concept for me. Um, and, and like the the fan, um, I don't know if they're like the, the fans were able to vote on potential team names. I don't know if the fans are going to get the final say. But um, but yeah, I'm, is there any any other spots where you can point to where you're like, this is not how we usually see it in the NHL? Yeah, just the personal touch, I think you're right. Just the accessibility of this team to the uh, fan base. You do see that in other markets. Um, You know, you saw that. I'm going to compare them to Florida just because they're top of mind. But for years, as the Florida Panthers tried to build the winning culture, both in business and on the ice, like they had to reach out to fans of like, hey, it's really affordable to come to our games. That was almost gimmicky, though, of just like, hey, we need to fill the seats. This with Ryan Smith feels more like, okay, we want to build this bond where we understand your needs and where you're coming from at access points. But like, once you come in here, you're part of our family too. Um, As far as his tech innovation, I think you'll see it in the way that their games are presented. You know, he's been very forward in creating um, his own production company to broadcast Utah Jazz games. You know, they're doing that similarly um, with the Utah. And, you know, you mentioned that there was no name and he's kind of canvassing. We all know it's going to be the Yeti. Um, I feel like it's almost the biggest uh, worst kept secret in the league right now. Um, So I I think that all has been positive, too, of just kind of seeing what he's doing in terms of delivering uh, the game to fans. And that's something I see across all the sports or all the teams in this league, rather, Um, you know, we, they have traditional RSNs, they have traditional team websites, they're all expanding their own personal media um, outreach and figuring out ways that they can monetize it and they can grow um, their imprint within their market. And I think that's something that you're going to see as a trend throughout the league. I've been an early campaigner for Yeti as the name, or Yetis, it would be my preference. But I'll, No, I'll no one Yeti. seems to know the pluralized uh, correct version, so I'm sure they're going to have to do some kind of PSA. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. G- good logo possibilities, though. Um yeah, and you mentioned that the league is, you know, trying to to grow as as all leagues are. Um, this always feels like, you know, it's it's hard for hockey to have like a big multiplier for some reason. It's you know just like go into a new market or reach a new demographic, and all of a sudden things are like fifty percent bigger than they used to be, or like now they're on TikTok and every you know all the young people are sharing their hockey highlights. I'm sure that's happening to some degree, uh, but because it is more of a close knit thing, and also the game, I think is just more of an acquired taste um, for a lot of fans honestly, just because it's harder to, it's hard to track the puck in a way that's not hard in other sports. Um, But yeah, I'm just wondering your thoughts on like the state and trajectory of the league right now. Great question. Well, we are at an inflection point because the CBA next year is the last year of it. Gary Bettman has said he wants to talk to the PA very soon. And like, idealistically, he's like, we're going to announce something uh, day one of the Stanley Cup final. Now, those were pie in the sky idealistic. There's reasons why he said that. You know, I actually just talked to Marty Walsh, the NHLPA boss this morning. It's Friday. Um, he was slow paying it a bit of just saying like, hey, you know, we just want to make sure all of our ducks in a row. I talked to all of the players. We know where we stand. The reason I bring up CBA, though, is because I've been talking to players about what's important to them in this next CBA. And there's not a single issue that really is going to be a sticking point. The one thing that they care about most is growing revenue across the league 
so that their share of the pie is even larger. And, you know, we've seen some incremental growth, as you said, you know, the NHL is engaged more in social media. There's a TikTok presence. The Amazon show um, has been a nice injection of energy, um, you know, with players for the first time being like, all right, fine, you can go film me unvarnished and I will not get final say of the cut. Um, I think they did a really good project. And I know Amazon's relationship with the league seems like it's only going to grow from here. It's a budding relationship right now. Um, but I think that they want to look at some outside ideas as well, because the truth is the NHL is still very dependent on gate revenue. Um, it's one of the reasons why there's so many preseason games. And they did a good job with the US TV deal. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, um, but they know that there's more money to be had. And I think the players and owners both are like, OK, we know we've grown incrementally and, you know, we've been a conservative approach, but it's time to take that next jump. So I think the next year here is going to be crucial. Speaking of your particular bias, this is the fourth year since ESPN's um, had the NHL back. Um, and w what are you guys trying to bring uh, in terms of how you present this game and tell stories around it? Yeah, thank you for asking. It's super kind. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, we didn't have the rights for 17 years, um, and that's a really long time. And then when we came back on air four years ago, it was super exciting. And we're all like, wow, hockey's back on ESPN, all of the nostalgia. But a lot of the people, both in front of the camera, but mostly behind the scenes, hadn't been a part of the NHL, um, either for two decades or ever. And so there was a bit of a learning curve. And I felt like first year, we're kind of figuring it out, you know, we know how we like to produce games for the NFL and NBA and college sports, but like how does hockey fit into that mold and how is it different? Year two, I thought we got a bit more comfortable. And last year, we had the Stanley Cup final again. I felt like we really found our stride. You know, our studio guys are finding their voices. You know, Marc Bessier, it's crazy for me to like try to even talk about critiquing Marc Bessier, but he improved so much. Like he's such a good analyst now and the chemistry he's had with P.K. Subban, who's established himself as a voice you know, that can be seen on the Pat McAfee show and first take, like, that's all fantastic for our sport. And obviously Steve Levy does such a good job. Um, so I think the comfortability that we have in year four, um, you're just going to see it as a more seamless product. And then I think just infiltrating some of our other properties. You know, I mentioned PK being on those shows. I think there's more of a willingness to talk about hockey um, on other programming. You see it way more on social media. I see our Twitter accounts, our Instagram accounts, our T TikTok accounts. Um, showing clips and using our content. And I think that all is what the NHL was hoping for, to tap into the resources and infrastructure of ESPN. We're, we're really seeing the fruits of it now. Shifting gears a little bit here. Uh, we just had two games in Prague, a uh, couple more in Finland coming later in the season. Interesting locations to, um, to have your international games, but also like hockey strongholds in Europe. What do you think it says about the NHL's plans to grow internationally? Yeah, I think the NHL always wants to have that international footprint. It is such an international game. Again, we talked about untapped revenue. Okay, there's hundreds of millions of potential fans all across the world. How can we get them to watch our product? I think the NHL, quite frankly, this is my personal opinion, has made a couple of missteps along the way. You know, they sent a game to Australia last year. That's super cool. That's fun. The time zone, the interest in the sport, the accessibility of the sport, is that really where we should be putting our resources? I think that there should be a game in Mexico by now. That makes way too much sense, you know, either connecting with the Latina community that's here in North America, but also just tapping into our neighbors down south. And I know the Vegas Golden Knights are dying for more of a established presence with Mexico. I'm sure the LA Kings and so many of those other teams that are around that region are as well. So I think it's good that they still have this, you know, international aspirations. And I think that they're starting to see business grow, specifically in Europe, where it's a lot easier to catch the games because of the time difference. Um, but I don't think we're in a position where we're like, there is going to be a team based in London anytime soon. We're, we're not at that point yet. And lastly, before I let you go, um, I, I want to know who you think is, is good <laughs> in hockey this year. Uh, give me, uh, is, is, who, who are kind of like our, you know, teams to beat? You know, totally. give me like two or three of those. So I feel like the trend in the NHL, you know, it's always such a copycat league. You see the Florida Panthers make it all the way to the Stanley Cup final. They lose. They get so close to their ultimate goal and they come back even stronger and win it. And because of that, it feels like the default answer and the team to be maybe the main character of the NHL this year is the Edmonton Oilers. They made it to the Stanley Cup final. Connor McDavid's there. Leon Dreisaitl re-signed. I don't think he would have re-signed already unless they made it to the Stanley Cup final and he could tell that he was that close. Um, so the Oilers are the team to beat, but they've got really stiff competition in the West. 
the Stars are a dirty, dirty team. Uh, they got that right mix of veteran players. They've drafted well. Those young guys are now flourishing. And as long as Jake Ottinger performs to his potential, and I've got a lot of faith in that kid and goal, um, I think that they're going to go on a long run. And then in the East, it's pretty crowded. I mean, you've got the Florida Panthers who really – don't want to take a step back, know how important momentum is to their market. And they've done a great job. You know, there has been turnover, but again, I feel like they've put the right culture in place, the right identity in place. I expect them to be very good. Boston Bruins, their biggest rival, the Maple Leafs, you know, as long as goaltending holds up, that's always the caveat. And then I'm looking over your shoulder. I know you want me to talk about them, but your New Jersey Devils <laughs> are kind of, yeah, <laughs> that sleeper team where, you know, they got the goaltending and Jacob Markstrom, all their young guys, they, they got some sneaky good moves, um, you know, for some grit as well, veterans. So I think them and the Rangers will be battling atop the Metro division all year. All right. Well, I'll, I'll leave it on that very positive note. Uh, Emily Kaplan, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate you, Owen. The Houston Texans are off to a 5-1 and one start, and no small part to second-year defensive end Will Anderson Jr. Anderson, who leads the team with five and a half sacks, joins the show to talk about his young career with the Texans and what it was like transitioning from Alabama to the NFL and what he thinks about the league's new rule changes. That conversation is up next. Joined now by Texans defensive end, Will Anderson Jr. Welcome, Will. How you doing? Great. Great to have you on. So, you know, you came from one of the top football programs in Alabama. How big of an adjustment was it to go from a top college program to the NFL? You want to know something? It was actually an easy adjustment. I would just say as far as like time management, because you have way more time now than you did in college. Like in college, it's like you have something every hour of the day. And now it's just like, well, you got meetings, practice, and then you're done around like four and stuff like that. But you get more time to, you know, take care of your body and stuff like that. But just as far as practice, like practice at Alabama was hard. So when I got here and I seen the way Coach D'Amico ran practice, which was hard too, I was like, oh, this is easy. Like I'm used to this. This is how I've been practicing my whole life. You, you know, you've got one of the, the best young quarterbacks right now in C.J. Stroud. And I feel like there's this ongoing debate in the NFL around, you know, more and more teams are expecting to like have their, their first round quarterback pick step in day one and and be a C.J. Stroud, be successful. Doesn't work out every time. Um, but I feel like your experience in Alabama shows why some teams expect that. And of course, you know, Stroud's success shows how it can work. Um, just what do you think about, I mean, both him, but also about that expectation of people being ready game one of their careers? Yeah, when I would start, start with CJ first, I just like CJ is a special individual. Like it's, you can't, it's not, it's not easy to do what he did. You know what I'm saying? He's very gifted, a great person on and off the field and the way he stepped in for this team and he's been leading us has been fantastic. And what he did last year was just, a step is on of what he's going to continue to do in his career. And I really just think, like, when you have young players, I think Coach D'Amico did it right. Like, he came in, he talked to us, and he said, man, like, there's no expectation. Like, I don't want any of y'all to come in here and try to be a superhero. I just want y'all to be yourselves. Like, I just want y'all to do what y'all been doing your whole entire lives. And that's just going out, having fun, and playing ball. And I think that's what made me and CJ so much more relaxed, where we could have just – we were we could just be ourselves and have fun, and we didn't have to come in – and get this like what our success just happened because we were just being ourselves and i think that's how you have to approach it with young players like you can't go in there and put an expectation on them and make them feel like they have to do this that and the third you know what i'm saying just you know for me i feel like when you do that it just kind of puts a, like a lot of more pressure on you and i think coach ryan's he did it the right way he came to us and like man i just want y'all to have fun like i just want you guys to be the dogs that y'all are and come in here and be ourselves and i think a lot of coaches come in with expectations and saying well you did this in college you need to do this now like no like i'm young it's my first time in the league let me just be me let me ball out let me do my thing and have fun and i think that's why players love coach ryan is because he gets it he understands it and he wants the best for his players was there any stage fright you know, in the, those first game or two in the NFL where you're on, obviously Alabama is a big stage too, but you're on the biggest stage now. Oh, of course. Of course. The nerves are always going to be there. Uh, 
playing Baltimore, and it was crazy because we had to play Baltimore. And I was like, ooh, this is going to be a good one. Like, this is going to be a good test for us. And just going out there, looking up, and just seeing all the fans and everything like that, it was really like an eye-opening experience. And I was just so grateful for that opportunity. And I think after, like, the first series or, like, the first play, I was fine. Like, I was like, oh, this is just ball. Like, it's just this is what I be doing in practice every day. Like, this is what I see. So I could go out there and play fast. Now you're you're having an impact off the field as well. Tell me about the work you're doing with Campbell's. Yeah, um, I think it's a special opportunity they're doing. Um, you know, for every sack in the NFL, um, Campbell's is donating um, thousand meals. You know, to um, those in need and feeding America. And I've been able to have two and a half sacks, and um, it just shows you know how much more it is just on the field, but more off the field to help those people. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I think it's a great opportunity, especially with everything going on right now with the weather and hurricanes and everything like that. More people are in need. So I feel like this is just God's timing to be able to package, you know, all these foods and be here and have fun with the workers and get all this stuff going on. I, I think it's really special. Getting back to the NFL, there's some, so you're in your second year and you already have some rule changes coming in from the league, you know, there's no more hip drop tackle. We've got the new kickoff. Would you say it was easier or harder for you compared to someone who's been in the league longer to make those adjustments? I feel like it's probably more challenging for someone who's been in the league a little longer because like they've been used to something for probably probably like eight years and now they have like these new rules in here saying that you can't do this but this is what they've been doing their whole careers and stuff like that especially like with the kickoff rules and then they help track and drop rule i just feel like that rule is just like well, we're just out there making play. We can't determine how we bring a guy down. Like, we're not purposely trying to do it. We're not purposely trying to in injure anybody. We're just playing football and flying around, having fun. So I think they're trying to control the game a little bit. But um, I see from a player's safety and from their point of view. Um, but um, I would say for a person that's been in the league a little longer, I think it's a little bit more challenging for them. I've I've been getting – I've been surprised at the mixed reaction I've been getting Um from players, especially about the new rules. I think a lot of them just, you know, they kind of like how things were. Um, do you like the new kickoff? Um, yeah, I think it's cool. Um, yeah, I think it's cool. Uh, I think the NFL is just trying to get, you know, more points on the board. But I think just watching our kickoff team, we go down and we fly around and we've been making some big hits. So I also think it's a lot more plays being made on the, the you know, the defense side going down, hitting people, and it's awesome to see. Yeah, and on that, that player safety piece that you, you mentioned, the NFL just came out with a report that concussions were way down in the preseason. Uh, it was still 44 concussions that they recorded uh, preseason alone, which, you know, that's still kind of a, a big number. Um, how, how do you think the league's been doing in terms of um, safety, player safety, and, and how far do you think they have to go? Yeah, I think they've been doing a pretty good job. I know they talked about the guardian caps and helping guys in that way um, and being safe. I think all the necessary, you know, precautions have been taken to help player safety. Um, I know it's just going to continue to grow and get better. So I'm looking forward to it, but um, we're just going to go out there and just keep playing the game that we've been playing for this very long time. Absolutely. Well, good luck on the season. Will Anderson Jr., thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I bring you. Time now for FOS Tomorrow, where we look ahead to the biggest stories to come in the business of sports. While Matthew Stafford is still very much the LA Rams starting quarterback, it seems that he is beginning to lay the groundwork for his post-playing career. During the Rams bye week, the 16-year veteran made appearances on Fox's NFL pregame shows, giving a sneak peek of what might be to come for Stafford after he hangs up the cleats. And Stafford shined on his broadcast debut. He took time to share his thoughts on the Rams season so far, the new wave of NFL quarterbacks, and what he wants his legacy to be after he officially retires from the league. So while Stafford's career is certainly starting to wind down, 16 years in the NFL will certainly take a toll on the person, don't expect to stop seeing him on Sundays anytime soon. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you're subscribed on the platform of your choice. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.